Hi and welcome to Counting Coral Chats. I'm Jolien Collier and I will be your host for today's interview. Here at Counting Coral, we like to reach out and interview people from all walks of life. Some folks are about ocean conservation and others can be marine biologists, scientists and just your average person doing extraordinary things. We are always looking for people to join us in one of our chats. If you are interested in what we do and you would like to be on our show, you can email us at connect at countingcoral.com. So please sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Hi and welcome to Counting Coral Chats with Christina Zanetto. Since 1994, Christina has been an active shark behaviorist underwater cave explorer, a champion for our oceans, photographer, speaker, and writer. She is the founder of the nonprofit People of the Water, organized to widen the distribution of training, education, research related to our oceans, and environmental issues. Welcome, Christina, and we really appreciate the time uh, you've taken out to sit down and chat with us. How are you today? Very good, thank you. Well, hey, before we jump into um, talking sharks and coral reefs and all that type of stuff, I'd like to uh, maybe if you could take the time to tell us a bit about your business and tell us a bit about your nonprofit. Um, how did you get into this and what kind of services do you provide to people that may be interested? Sure. So the, from a business point of view, I am, quote unquote, a diving professional. So I make my living by being an educator in the scuba diving environment. I specifically specialize in shark encounters. So one-on-one -on -one with people who want to come and do something very unique, which is really what I call shark yourself, being able to be in the middle of the sharks, Caribbean reef sharks, interact with them, handle them and understand more. I also teach uh, technical diving, primarily cave diving, rebreather diving, and obviously the gas is related with having to go to beyond the recreational diving limits and i'm a recreational diving instructor and i specialize primarily in a professional level so a dive master i'm a course director so i teach instructors and that's how i make a living the nonprofit was born last year as a, as a as a tail end of uh, what i've been doing for the last 25 years which is uh, kind of like a very difficult way to to describe uh, I have a passion for the ocean, which is professionally related, but I have a passion for the ocean. When I say ocean, sharks, caves, conservation, that is personally related. And so I always dedicated whatever time capabilities I had into uh, doing conservation work, into doing education work at the nonprofit level. So I was recommended to found a nonprofit to be able to expand because at this point I was only able to uh, reach only as far as I could self-finance. So the nonprofit was created to allow me to expand this work of cave exploration, conservation, the shark education, and the outreach to the public in general through right now Zoom meetings, but also classroom presentations, talks, and also on island training. So that's how the two interconnect. Yeah, it's a great way to be able to expand outside of your own sphere because obviously you can't financially, financially take on the burden of helping out other people and education and all the rest of it. So non-profit's the perfect kind of fit for you in that respect. And well, uh, how, well, how's that going in this environment now? I mean, you guys raising monies because I know we're having trouble. It's a big uh, I'm, we're struggling to raise money, to be honest with you. Uh, I have a little bit of a difficulty asking. <laughs> but um, one of the things is I was already doing, you know, personal outreach to people. It's just I can only reach one or two people a year. So hopefully with a nonprofit, I should be able and would be able to reach uh, more. Um, right now, it is a little bit struggling due to the situation. So we have some supporters that through the sales of their products give us a, a percentage. We have little shops ourselves, uh, but hopefully with time and once obviously the economy resumes a little bit, it's going to be a little bit easier, but it has helped already a little bit. 
Well, we'll place a link down in the link section below for your nonprofit organization. So if people want to contribute to that and help out, they can do that. Um, and yeah, we appreciate the hard work that you guys put into that. It's, it's nothing better than spreading the education and awareness and driving all those messages and getting people into, involved. So it's a brilliant thing that you're doing. So in your business model, I know that you uh, worked with Will Smith. And the reason why I'm bringing him up is because of the fear of sharks. He has a fear of sharks. You don't need to talk about Will, but kind of on that thread, um, you know, the consciousness of human beings has been very... Uh, um, tainted by sharks in terms of these these images of terror and all the rest of it. You can use Will as an example if you want to, but how how does that work with you guys? Do you do you help get people into the water that are really fearful of sharks? How do how does that work? How do you encourage people? Is it like a hundred sharks around, or is it like you try and find one shark to ease them into the process? How does that work? Well, we can decide how many sharks are going to be around because yeah. that's what the sharks decide. <laughs> Uh, the process usually starts with the uh, a communication. So it could be a written communication, could be a verbal communication, best obviously if it's verbal one-on-one. -on -one. And it's uh, sustained by facts and also by images. So we start by showing, it's like, hey, look, these are the pictures of people going diving with sharks. These are the people going swimming with the sharks. But it also goes into the education about the word shark. Every time we say shark, everybody literally hears the, su the sound, right? And they kind of like see like the dorsal fin just coming across the screen. And I think uh, what we need to expand into that is a shark is like saying birds. So we need to start understanding that there are sharks that are the size of this pen. This is a shark. It's called the lantern shark. It used to be called the dwarf shark, but this is a shark. And there's a shark that is as big as a bus, but feeds on plankton. And so once we start differentiating in between sharks, are there potentially dangerous animals out there in the ocean towards a human safety? Absolutely. Should we put them all together into this word and just be fearful of the entire family? Absolutely not. And I think that is where it starts. And then if someone is really afraid of sharks, maybe they want to start with uh, some sharks that are in the mind easier to deal with. So rather than jumping into the water with a tiger shark, and I'm not saying the tiger shark is more dangerous, but mentally it is an intimidating shark. It's a predatory sharks can reach up to, you know, three, two and a half, three meters in length. So we're talking about a, a really beefy animal, maybe jump in a shark in water with Caribbean reef sharks, like the one I work with, or go snorkeling with the whale sharks, so that the concept of the shark world already has more of an expansion. So that's how I work on it. If people are here, is uh, by taking them in the water and literally showing them how the sharks are around us and not paying attention to us. Yeah, um, I, I've only had one scary shark experience and it had nothing to do with being threatened by a shark. I was in Fiji about 20 years ago filming on a very shallow reef and I was just filming this nice little coral outcrop and a shark just popped right up in front of the camera. I went, oh, <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> expecting it. I've never had a problem with sharks and uh, I, I think people are slowly getting to understand that. I mean, there's been enough education. Shark Week, there's, there's tons of stuff that's going out there. So I applaud you for your efforts and trying to, you know, spread the awareness of sharks that aren't dangerous. Uh, you know, obviously, they, it's much like a cat and a lion. You can pet a cat. Would you go up and pet a lion? You know, some people's fear of like a small reef shark versus a great white shark are validated. You know what I mean? But they're all... There's a tangible degree of elevation on fear-based levels and stuff like that. So I wanted to ask you, like, just the basic stuff. How did you get into the ocean, into diving, and then how did that go into sharks? Because you're nicknamed the Shark Whisperer. You do some amazing stuff with sharks. But how did it all begin for you? Where did it all start? Uh, well, it starts with my family. I come from a family that is uh, passionate about the ocean, loves to go, and it doesn't have to be specific activities. My dad was a military diver, so I actually grew up with these quite impressive black and white pictures of his adventures back in the 50s, and a little bit of, a, I, I do, idolized a little bit what he did. But then the rest of my family is a family of the Mediterranean. I'm originally from Italy, so... Uh, my family on my mom's side, my, one of my uncles had a sailboat and his job was to take people sailing around the Mediterranean. So there was always this connection with the water. 
I was brought to the water since very young age, uh, taught how to swim. I had my fins, my mask, and I had a childhood dream. I wanted to become an underwater scuba ranger that will roam the oceans and tell divers what to do and what not to do and have sharks for friends. That was my childhood dream. I didn't want to be a ballerina. That was exactly what I wanted to do. How it came to be it was a little circumstantial. I studied languages and tourism, and I was working in the hotel industry, which I absolutely loved. And on the term of the dime, I was given vacation. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go and do that scuba diving thing that I always heard about. I didn't really know much, but I knew you could become scuba diving certified. And so I went into a travel agency, 1994, and I said, I want to become a scuba diver. <laughs> um, and I gave them a list, you know, like the Red Sea, the Seychelles, Mauritius, the places that you will go from Italy, more likely. And none of them was available. And they said, well, we have uh, the Bahamas. It's a honeymoon destination. You might not find many people to, you know, interact with because everybody's on a honeymoon. But they have a dive center. And so I took, I took the package, I took the deal, I landed in this place, I did my open water course, and on my first open water dive, there were sharks, the same sharks that I'm working with. And I was like, you have sharks here? And it was really interesting, because for them, it was just kind of like, yeah, huh? of course we have sharks, what are you talking about? There's sharks in the dive every day. They, you know, they're so comfortable with having so many sharks, they thought it was like one of the, they don't realize there's people that travel the world to go and see sharks. And so in a week time, I quit everything. I quit my job, I quit my boyfriend, I quit my life in Italy, and I moved to the Bahamas to work in the hotel that I was staying at, thanks to the languages and my background, to then continue to scuba dive. My plan was to stay for a year, you know, get the diving out of my system. In 26 years, I haven't got it out of my system yet, but I wanted to stay for a year and then go back home and resume my quote-unquote real job so would you ever look back to that and make it say, say there was a, a regret it doesn't sound like it you are definitely on uh, a path for the rest of your life in my opinion I think that's going to be for you for forever there was no regret is there sometimes a worry of course it's a, it's a physical job it's a demanding job I'm aging like everyone else but I don't, I'm not even worried more, you know, about the, oh, what am I going to do if I can't do this uh, from like a financial point of view? I should, but I'm more worried about what's going to happen the day I cannot go in the water with my sharks. <laughs> no, no regret, none. <laughs> well, that's good. Uh, that's a great story. And it's fascinating to listen to people's stories about how they get into certain, um, you know, works or uh Courses in life, because courses in life can change on a dime, and sounds like yours changed on a dime very quickly. So that's an amazing story. But um, so let's talk about sharks. Um, you know, you know, we're into the uh, coral restoration business, and how? What are the roles of sharks in our oceans, and what are the roles of sharks when it comes to coral reefs? How many hours do we have? <laughs> we got twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> brief, so, brief explanation of that, if you could. Yes, I'm kidding. So the, the sharks are, the, the, uh, here we go back to people think that sharks are apex predators, and it's correct. But quite a lot of sharks are also what we call mesopredators, so a middle of the food chain of predators. And short of herbivorous, you have sharks in every level. So you have sharks that, yes, eat out of fish, but you also have fish that eat sharks and sharks that eat sharks. And their fundamental into maintaining the balance of all this intricate is not, everybody imagine it's a pyramid. It's not a pyramid. It's actually an intricate web, right? I'm here, but I'm also, there's someone here and then someone here, and then I'm connected to someone there. So if you, if you imagine it's, uh, it's like a game where you have, I can't remember the name, but all the blocks and you have to remove the blocks and keep it standing, right? If you remove the sharks, you may have to, things that collapse from the top, but also things that collapse from the bottom. And I think one of the, the biggest issues with sharks that people don't realize is uh, you remove most of the mesopredators, you will have an explosion of what are the um, 
fish that is dominated and actually controlled by them. They also control diseases. So they'll eat anything that is dying, decayed, injured. So they, if an animal is not making it, they will eliminate it and it will also um, reduce contamination in between the same species. So they're very important. If we want to put it within corals, it's very simple. Imagine if the sharks that actually uh, maintain, let's say, just one simple fish, because we can't make it complicated, the parafish, right? The sharks that maintain the level of the parafish at a certain level disappears. What's going to happen? We know parrots are grazers of, yes, the algae on top of the reef, but some of the reef goes with it too. So now you will have too many grazers on top of the reef and it will also obviously cause issues for the reef itself. Or the other way around, you have uh, herbivores that disappear and then algae that actually end up covering the, re the, the corals as well, which is one of the things that sometimes we see here. And the herbivores maybe disappear because of a disease that hasn't been able to be controlled because it's not the sharks that manage the fish that is contaminated is kind of like really simply put, but they manage in those two ways. So if you look, they could damage corals on both ways. I think they're extremely interconnected. Yeah, it's a complex system. And you, uh, I think every system on our planet is complex. And if you take one element out of that system, there's a trickle down effect and it always affects you know, us ultimately. Somewhere down the line, we're gonna be the victims of those links being broken or changed or manipulated. I read a study that um, fear from sharks on a reef has a huge importance on coral and habitation. So the concept was, well, hey, if we get rid of all the sharks, there's going to be hundreds and hundreds more fish because the predator is no longer existing. But that predator actually puts fear into fish. <laughs> now, yeah, it can eat the fish, it takes out the weak, the disease and all the rest of it, but it also places a little bit of fear for reproduction of those fish. So when you have sharks on a reef, the reefs are actually more healthy and have more biomass, which is completely uh, out of what you would normally think. You know, take the predator away, the little fish will grow. But you can't. They're interlinked. And it's very, very important. There is a study like that that shows exactly that in the Yosemite Park when they reinstalled the wolves. Yep. All of a sudden, a local fish in the river made a comeback. Yeah. And they're like, how is that connected? Is that the wolf reinstall the fear into the deers about being hunted and the deers are stopped grazing all along the rivers and they only went grazing where the river allowed them to actually wade across. Yeah, so it's the, amazing. They, they could change the, plant, the direction of a river, they could change the whole... Uh, they cha they stopped grazing the plant where the fish was laying its eggs and so then the fish was able to lay the eggs again and because of the wolf the fish made it come back. Yeah. So um, what are some of the goals that uh, uh, you have when it comes to helping sharks. Obviously, there is a massive issue with sharks, and I just read another article about the COVID. They reckon there's going to be about 500,000 sharks killed because they have a lot certain enzyme in their liver that could help the vaccine for COVID. This is just another hit that could potentially take on the sharks already outside of the 100 million that are caught every single year for either, you know, shark fin soup, which is absolutely ludicrous to me, and all these other issues. What are the, some of the goals that you could strive for or are striving for to help out sharks? Obviously, we're doing interviews and uh, podcasts and websites, uh, sorry, web, webinars to help educate people. What are the basic goals that you've taken upon yourself to try and uh, spread that message? Well, the, the first thing that I, I do, I did, is uh, you know, think globally, act locally. So uh, after uh, working with the sharks here for a very long time, I initiated a petition that when was picked up by Bahama National Trust and a pure organization, and the sharks are completely protected in the Bahamian waters. Mm -hmm. So that was my first step, is like, how do I protect what is that I am within and also within my reach? Um, I then use uh, these uh, sharks and the work that I have with them as the ambassadors towards the sharks uh, that do not have this protection. So they become the voice of uh, these, these sharks that are swimming in waters that are dangerous. And with that is uh, either a direct action. So when I bring people in the water, I have customers from all over the world who then go back and in their language start talking about shark conservation, languages that I would never be able to learn. And I'm talking about, I have people from 
Czech Republic to Russia, all the way to China and Japan come in here to do my classes. And when they go back, they are Japanese people, Chinese people that can say, we need to protect sharks. So I create ambassadors like that. I also uh, participated in several campaigns, uh, positive campaigns. One, one of the most powerful one was I'm finished with Finn campaign, which came out of both Hong Kong, Singapore, and uh, Kuala Lumpur. And it was, uh, it was locally with people famous in the area and then international people. I was one of the three invited together with David Dubillet. And uh, it was uh, a campaign in which each one of us will put something in front of their mouth you know, to symbolize I'm finished with Finn. If I was a photographer, we'll put the camera and I had my chairmail glove and I did, you know, like in front of my mouth, not that I ever ate shark fin soup. And so that campaign alone reduced the consumption of shark fin in Singapore alone by 33%. Wow. So I, tried, I tried to tackle what is the demand. Yeah. If you educate the demand, then if when the demand stops, also the killing stops. Uh, the other way is the one that I've been doing here is you need to give alternatives. So living in the Bahamas, but traveling also to Fiji and different parts of the world like Vietnam uh, is very obvious, right? We, we look at the shark fin soup and we think this is like this cultural evil that does not belong to us. But like the webs in the ocean is extremely complicated. And it goes into, it is culturally someone else. Yes, it's not a Western thing, but there's Western countries that still allows a full import, export, and consumption of shark fins, including Italy and Spain, and I'm Italian, including the United States and Canada, right? So uh, when that culture moves into the different country and the laws say, oh, no, yeah, sure, you can still have shark fins, then is that country's responsibility to say, well, I want to change that. So that's one. It's not culturally or remotely from us. It's actually culturally everywhere within us if the legislation is not protecting sharks. But the other one is we need to look at the fishermen. And we need to understand is why are they doing this? And I guarantee you that those at the bottom of the barrel, the ones who are out there on the boat fishing the sharks out and cutting their fins off are not the ones that are actually making the money. Those are the people who are actually to the bottom, I think, of our economical society. And people are saying, hey, if you do that, I give you a hundred dollars. It's like, well, wow, to make a hundred dollars, I need to go out fishing for a month. If I capture sharks and cut five fins off, I can make a hundred dollars and I can feed the family that is back on the village. So it goes back into the culture of saying, what are your options then? Right? Because if I say, don't fish, it's like, yeah. um, so my options are, and that's where I work into shark tourism, into People come here and pay, and I train Bahamians. So they pay a Bahamian company to go out with Bahamian crew to go and experience a protected animal, a protected ocean. And so all of a sudden, the Bahamian government turns around and goes like, and it might not be ideal for some people, but it's better than the other way around. But the Bahamian government turned around and said, wow, these sharks are very good for our economy. Yeah. We should actually take good care of them. And so they did. So that's how I tackle the issue. Well, I mean, that's amazing. I mean, uh, I can't thank you enough for your work. That's incredible. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. It has to start from your circle and, and go out. And there's a certain radius where it goes out, where it starts to permeate outside of yourself. Like yes. much like countries, county, uh, sorry, countries, communities, like the Bohemian, uh, sorry, <laughs> Bahaman government saying that this is now a valuable resource. We need to protect it. And that was a ripple that you dropped in the water and boom, you didn't really have to do much work once that ripple start going out because you're no longer that point of contact. You're no longer that, that ambassador. Somebody else is and it grows and it gets exponentially outside of yourself. So I really commend you for that. And that's amazing. And you did bring up the, the point that you had chain mail uh, a glove on. So I've seen a lot of documentaries over the years and I'm impressed the fact you actually wear chain mail. There's a lot of shark dive companies that don't. I think it's incredibly stupid because there are always that one chance that the shark can just come up and give you a little nip and then all of a sudden there's an issue. And there's another thing that I notice is you actually put electrical conduit 
on your tubes, which I thought was brilliant. <laughs> uh, who came up with that? And um, do you wear ch chain mail for that very reason, just in case something happens? I mean, that's great. So I handle the sharks physically. I also give them some food. So I wear the chain suit only in that situation when I'm in close proximity physical with them. I call it my beekeeper suit. Yeah. So if I go in the beehive, I will wear my beekeeper suit. If I sit in the grass looking at the bees that go flying from one daisy to the other, I will not. When I go and handle the sharks, I will wear the chain mail suit. And I do I wear that because I, th I think it's respectful towards what I am and what I preach, so my knowledge. But it's also due to the sharks because I protect myself to protect them. Because then when something goes wrong, then it turns around and the shark comes back into the bad voice but it also goes back then to the bad old you know shark diving is and it becomes like a whole negative thing so i'm a firm believer that it is a barrier that drops the barrier between us and, sh and the sharks and allows us to do these things in a safely manner so that the outcome is positive for everyone involved go rock climbing wear a helmet because a person above you hit, hits the rock with the heel and the rock comes down and hits the helmet instead of your head more or less is the same concept. So the sharks don't go around biting everything. But should a shark accidentally bite, it will feel once the texture, so the texture of the chain. Now imagine biting down on a potato that is wrapped in tin foil, right? And two, that chain will prevent lacerations from the teeth. The same goes for the conduit. The conduit came up as an idea just because all it takes is the sharks, you know, we have the hoses like this. We don't have the hoses like this anymore. Now we actually route them from underneath. Because when we first started diving, we had them recreational diving level. The shark all they had to do is go like this. And the dive was over because they perforated through the hose. So rather than, you know, every time losing a $40 hose, we put, put a little bit of conduit, shoot the shark by accidentally bite it, nothing happens. Well, that was a very clever idea, and I commend you for that one. <laughs> has, any, has a shark ever bitten the, the hose, and have you had to uh, obviously cut it short, or was that just something you imagined could happen? No, it actually happened. That's what they would do. They will come in, and maybe you did this movement, the shark comes around, and you have your alternate air source here, and the shark accidentally bit the hose, and, and off goes the dive. It's just like, you know, because it starts free-flowing, and so to avoid that issue we just coded them so wow. it just, and it makes the dive so much easier plus remember once you're like that then your safety obviously comes with training the chain mail and the conduit will not substitute training and a lot of common sense so it doesn't mean because i put a chain mail suit on i start doing uh, silly things or irresponsible things but once you train and you have that protection, then you're sitting there and obviously you know the level of protection you have. And so also your calmness increases, your relaxation. You say, yeah, I'm prepared. I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. It would kind of like, imagine if you go to a major exam and you didn't study. Or if you go to an exam and you study, yes, you're still nervous, but you're like, but I studied. Oh, I know this question. Yeah, I know this one. It's the same thing. You sit there and you're like, I'm prepared. There's everything in place to interact safely with them. The people that come down and watch us, they're a meter from us, a meter from the sharks. They don't wear protection. They don't need that because they're not physically handling the animals. Yeah, no, I, again, I commend you for being uh, using common sense. I mean, why wouldn't you uh, take all those approaches, A, to protect the shark for backlash if you did get bitten because it would always be directed to the shark. It wouldn't be directed to the person feeding the shark, stroking the shark and all the rest of it. So smart move and I really appreciate you taking that um, like approach to it. And I think more people that do offer those services to divers should take that approach also. And uh, more commonly you see people don't do that and it's just a recipe for disaster. So yeah, that's a great thing that you guys are doing. And um, could you, ex uh, so you do a couple things. You can put a shark into a, a catatonic state. Is that the right phrase or relax. state? Relax. relax state. Yeah. But then you also remove shark uh, hooks out of sharks. Now are those, hooks coming from long lines or are they more sport fishermen type things and do you do that while they're asleep or just grab the shark pull it out really quick how does that work in, in the two how do they kind of align themselves do we in the bahamas 
They actually banned long lining and drift nets since 1986, thanks to the work of Dr. Gruber. Wow. Yes, so we don't have long lining, at least legally, we're not supposed to have long lining. <laughs> Um, so most of the hooks I would say come from sport fishing, uh, maybe some deep fishing. I would not be surprised if some come from people, um, although there's a lot that says you can't fish sharks, you can't land sharks. I would not be surprised if someone out there just going up to catch shark, catch and release just for the thrill of it, which I never understood. So they end up with tiny hooks, which tells me those were for regular fishing. They also end up with like giant hooks, which could be for maybe other animals like tuna or, you know, swordfish. But for sharks, maybe, right? So the hooks are removed all are different in range in shape and size. Some sharks, what I do is I put them to sleep. So when the sharks go to sleep, it's only certain animals that allow me to put them to sleep. So I try to put them to sleep. If one of them that I put to sleep has a hook, I'll put her to sleep and then I'll kind of like use it to look at the hook. But it almost seems that they know it because when they have a hook and they go relax, as soon as they're looking for the hook, they're like, and swim away. <laughs> so quite a lot is more of a kind of like stop and grab the hook and try to wiggle. There's a few where you'll see me putting the shark down a little bit as they relax. It allows me to grab the hook. But as soon as the hook starts hurting, the shark will try to move out of my hands, which is normal. No animal will sit there going, oh, yeah, this hurts. I'm just going to sit here. However, what is amazing is the shark keeps coming back. Yeah. I've had sharks that allow me to try 15, 20 times in one dive to remove their hook. So they'll, they'll go, oh, it hurts and come back. Oh, it hurts and come back and that for me is the amazing part because i know they know i'm trying to help that's me in the dentist chair it hurts <laughs> it hurts <laughs> takes 20 times and a bit of sedation maybe there yeah <laughs> so yeah oh uh, yeah i mean that's fascinating i also saw you put your hand right down in the side of a mouse a shark's mouth and retrieve a hook too um is that pretty common to have shark Sharks with uh, hooks inside their mouths? Yes, they end up having them. The, the worst ones that I hate is when they end up like upside down on the palate. That's a is hard Because they swallow the, swallow the hook as Some opposed to trying to bite swallow them. Hooks. Right. Some sharks swallow hooks. Uh, the most dangerous hooks that I've removed or I've seen are the ones that go through the mouth and then for whatever reason make their way through their gills. And then I hang in between their gills. Those are the hardest one also to remove. I can't just go and pull because I may rip the gills. So those are the ones uh, a lot of times when they end up doing that, I really put the shark to sleep. And then maybe someone else also helps me or I kind of like try to remove, you know, like gently the hook out of the gills. But definitely do swallow them. I've seen, um, we even had a grouper that had a hook that was coming from underneath. It was dangling underneath her chin. And I, but she, you know, groupers are, uh, are good. I was able to actually uh, train her and then I remove her hook. Uh, we had nurse sharks with hooks uh, through their nostrils, for example. Mm -hmm. So they go in different places. I can confirm that they swallow them, but considering where I've seen the hooks going, I'm pretty <laughs> sure some of them have been swallowed. You can only assume they swallow them. At some yeah. Point. yeah. So, um, unbelievable work I, I can't imagine myself ever putting my hand in the shark's mouth but i appreciate that you're doing it um have you ever been in a situation that's just been too overwhelming uh with sharks like too many numbers or has it just been pretty much across the board uh pretty like you know consistent so no in the environment where i'm with my sharks i'm usually uh, pretty much consistent in numbers and behavior they're a little bit uh, more agitated after we went back after covid it was just kind of like this uh, like super clingy they wouldn't leave like usually they disperse and they come in a little bit but when we came in after covid it was almost six months it was just gonna you're back <laughs> <laughs> uh the only time and it, and all of these interactions are species dependent. I remember once I was in Rhode Island, I was uh, free diving with blue sharks, which is a pelagic, so deep water. And I, I ended up being in the water with just one other person, the videographer, and it was just the two of us. And at a certain point, the sharks, the blue sharks, their nature is very inquisitive. Um, 
what you don't want them to do specifically those pieces is to touch you once they tap you that means they broke the barrier and so at a certain point we had seven blues and it was just the two of us and we were playing working with them and you know there was just and when i'm working i'm saying free diving swimming trying to take videos and then they start tapping us and they tapped us once and they tapped us twice and we looked at each other and we're like hey eh, we're out of the water no, um simply because that's what the sharks has given you as a signal. But I mean, I think that is a human can give you that, you know, maybe your wife can give you that uh, irritable right now signal that makes you <laughs> walk away. So does the animals like my dogs. If my dog is stressed, that's that stress yawn, for example. So there are um, behaviors that tells you it's like time to take a breather. But I don't consider that the sharks are aggressive or, you know, tying to obviously human men eaters or anything like that. It's just, uh, it's just understanding how the sharks work. So when you have seven sharks and they start tapping you and then now they know that they can tap you. So that means they know they've broken their barrier. It's just time to get out. They can't, so we can. The next step would be a tap and then maybe a little nip to see what you are kind of thing, right? Correct. Uh, well, I can't thank you enough. I've got a few a few quick questions for you. Yeah. Uh, just almost like one answers, and I know they might be difficult. What's your favorite dark shark to dive with? I would stick with my Caribbean reef shark, <laughs> just because it's just one of the most interactive that I can have with. Um, followed by the blue sharks. Yeah. Um, um, what is the best place you've ever dove with sharks? What is it? What is the best place you've ever been to, like a location that you've had the experience of diving with sharks? The Bahamas. <laughs> right, this island. On this island, I can do the Caribbean reef sharks. I can do Tiger Beach with the tigers, the lemons, the bulls of the Caribbean reef sharks out like three hours from here. And we have Cat Island with the oceanic white tip, the great hammerheads in Bimini, and there's sharks when I go cave diving by the blue holes. The bomb oh, is for me. You guys have got it all out there, huh? That's yes. And um, what is the largest uh, number of sharks you've ever dove with? 80. What? That's amazing. Fiji with the bull sharks in Benga Adventure Divers. They do like a bull shark run. There's about 80 bull sharks. And on that dive, and that dive only had 80, but then it's like different multi-level dives. You also do, There's also thorny nurse sharks down at depth. Then the bull sharks, they are shallower. And then you go up to the reef and there's black tips and white tips and uh, gray reef sharks. But uh, the largest number was 80 bull sharks. Well, I'll have to go down to Fiji again because I've spent many, many years diving down there and I've never been with 80 sharks, maybe, <laughs> maybe 10 tops. But that's incredible. Well, listen, uh, Christina, I can't thank you enough for joining us. We really do appreciate your time and all the information that you've given us. Any of the links that people are looking for, we'll provide those either down in the link section or up in bios if you're on Instagram and Facebook and all that good stuff. So thank you once again. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Counting Coral relies on public support. If you would like to donate to Counting Coral and help out with the coral crisis, please see the link in the comments section if you are on YouTube, link in the bio if you are on Instagram, link in the post section if you're on Facebook or LinkedIn. The best way to follow us for Counting Coral Chats is to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button and then hit the bell. When you hit the bell, you will be notified every time we post new content.